Okay, good morning everyone and happy April 18th. The redevelopment agency meeting is called to order. This meeting has been properly noticed and posted in compliance with the open meeting law. These proceedings are being video recorded as well as presented live on KCLV, cable channel 2 and are closed captioned for hearing impaired visitors. Viewers, excuse me. Please note some customers of Cox Communication who do not have a cable box may view this meeting on digital channel 89.5. The redevelopment agency meeting as well as all other KCLV programming may be viewed on the city's website www.kclvtv. The proceedings will be rebroadcast on KCLV channel 2 and the web the Wednesday of the meeting at 8 p.m., also on Friday at 4 a.m., Saturday at 7 p.m., Sunday at 7 a.m., and the following Monday at 1 p.m. This building is protected by state-of-the-art fire detection and suppression sprinkler system. If the alarms should activate during today's meeting, please evacuate using the exits at the back of the chambers out to the mezzanine. Proceed out the double doors to the terrace and down the back staircase. Once outside, assemble on the northeast corner across the street from City Hall at Lewiston First Street. Employees wearing safety vests or our city marshals will inform you when it's safe to re-enter the building. Is there anyone present today who has a need for hearing impaired equipment? If so, the city clerk's office staff will make sure that you um, are served with our equipment. If you parked in the parking garage across the street and did not receive a validation ticket as you entered chambers, please exit to your right and then see the security personnel at the entrance. We will now move on to item number three. Public comment during this portion of the agenda must be limited to matters on the agenda for action. The amount of time any single speaker will be allowed may be limited. All comments made will be cross-referenced to those specific items. If anyone submitted a speaker card or who wishes to speak under this portion of the agenda, please come forward to the podium at this time and state your name for the record. Hearing none, thank you. We will move on to item four. For possible action to approve the final minutes by reference of the regular redevelopment agency meeting of April 4th, 2012. May I have a motion to approve the minutes, please? Motion to approve the minutes. There's a motion. Please vote. Please post. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Motion carries. We'll now move on to item number five, RA4-2012, discussion for possible action regarding a resolution finding the project proposed by the Commercial Visual Improvement Program, CVIP, agreement between the City of Las Vegas Redevelopment Agency, the RDA, and Mesquite Wood II LLC owner and Velveteen Rabbit LLC tenant and CVIP participant located at 1218-1226 South Main to be in compliance with and in furtherance of the goals and objectives of the redevelopment plan and authorizing the execution of the CVIP agreement by the RDA not to exceed 25,000 RDA special fund revenue. This is in Ward 3, Councilman Coffin's Ward. Note this item is related to the Council Item 63, R-34-2012. Mr. Arndt, good morning. Good morning, Mayor, members of Council. For the record, Bill Arndt, Director, Economic and Urban Development. Uh, this item before you today is part of our popular Visual Improvement Program, VIP program, where we help small businesses with small grants to improve the facades of older storefronts and we're delighted to recommend approval for this project. Uh, business owner is opening an urban lounge in the Arts District on Main Street, and the uh, property owner and the business owners will be doing extensive interior and exterior renovations. The property had been damaged by fire. They're looking to put a total of $250,000 into the building. The bulk is going in the interior. For the exterior, they're gonna be doing approximately $75,000, including signage. Uh, they are eligible for a grant of $25,000, and staff does recommend approval. And if I could get assistance from, it may already be up on your overhead, we do have a few pictures 
of uh, what the building is going to look like once the improvements are done. Uh, with that, I'd like to introduce the owners of the business, Velveteen Rabbit, uh, to say a few remarks about the business and what they're looking to do with the property. Good We'd morning. look forward to hearing from you, and I'd like you at one point to tell us how did you come up with the name Velveteen Rabbit. Sure. <laughs> Um, good morning. I'm Christina Dilag. This is my sister Pamela Dilag. Uh, we are so excited to be a part of the Arts District. We think we're going to be uh, providing something really unique. Um, definitely having a forum for art, music, craft cocktails, craft beer at affordable prices, really just contributing to the culture of Las Vegas. Um, I was traveling and I came up with the idea to start a bar and um, basically <laughs> the name more or less came to me but it was Pamela's favorite childhood book um, when she was growing up and uh, the story itself is very, um, it parallels our journey of basically turning a, an idea into something real. So. Wonderful. <laughs> Any comments, questions in Councilman Coffin? Your Honor, this is a, a, a wonderful project. Uh, it's being slowed down a little bit because of the overkill by the Gaming Commission and Gaming Control Board in trying to lasso Dotties and bring them down to earth. They managed to hook all our little urban lounges in and, and force them to do things that they can't afford, um, and about 30 other bars and taverns around town, not including Dotties. So we're hoping that they'll get a waiver on some of those outrageous requests from the gaming industry and that they will be able to proceed as a good small business ought to here in downtown Las Vegas. With that, I, I move for approval. Thank you very much. There's a motion. Please vote. Please post. Motion carries. Congratulations, ladies. We'd love to come to your opening. Oh, Please or do. Your ribbon come. Very exciting. When's that going to be? We're very excited. Um, we are still waiting for our building permit, so that should be, we've applied. It should be within the next few weeks, hopefully. Great. Um, so we're looking at another three-month build-out, so hopefully August. Wonderful. Well, good luck. This is Thank great you. for the area and great for the city and Just county as well. <laughs> That's the luck. You're going to have a Thank good time. You. Hope you have a bed in the back so you can get some rest. <laughs> good Thank luck you to so you. Much. Thank you. Take care. And now we will move on to item number six, public hearing for possible action on a joint disposition and development agreement between the City of Las Vegas, City of Las Vegas Redevelopment Agency and Vegas One Dash Decatur LLC regarding the possible lease of real property located along Laurel, Hearst and Westmoreland Drives and 1501 Decatur Boulevard to Vegas One Dash Decatur LLC for the construction of mixed income and age restricted housing. This is in Ward 5. Councilman Barlow's ward. Note this item is related to RDA item 7, RA 5-201-2, and council items 59, 60, and 64, R-35-201-2. This is a public hearing, which I now declare open. Mr. Arndt, please. Thank you, Mayor, members of council. Uh, this item before you is a proposal uh, by a developer to develop a site that is owned uh, in part by the redevelopment agency and in part by the city of Las Vegas. I'm going to go through a very brief uh, presentation just outlining the project as well as staff's recommendation and then invite uh, the developer for the project, Mr. McDonald, to make a few remarks as well. Uh, today's, today's presentation Uh, we're ju I'm just going to go over the project, uh, the assistance requested by the developer for the project, the value for the purposes of AB 312. Uh, there is a requirement that if we sell or lease land below market value to cite an exemption, uh, as well as the staff recommendation. The proposed project, the developer is proposing a uh, mixed income housing project to be developed in three phases. 
Uh, the first phase would feature 60 units in sixplex buildings as well as a clubhouse. Uh, and f mixed income meaning some of the units are going to be for low income at 60% of area median income or below. And the remaining units would be at market rate. They're designed to be marketed to seniors uh, as well as families. Phase two and phase three would feature four-story buildings. Phase two would be a building which would contain 72 senior units as well as a second clubhouse. And then phase three would be 64 units in a four-story complex. Uh, visually what this would look like is there's a site uh, that we have that I mentioned we do have uh, separate ownership. It's not all owned by one entity for the city. Uh, there are some parcels which the city of Las Vegas acquired along Laurelhurst Drive and Westmoreland Drive and those are owned by the city. And then there's a parcel uh, which is just over six acres uh, which is owned by the redevelopment agency. Uh, so the redevelopment agency and the city are both parties to this transaction. Uh, phase one is being proposed to be developed along the Laurelhurst Drive and Westmoreland Drive parcels. And then phase two and phase three would be developed on the parcel which is marked RDA. Uh, Could you point to that because I can't quite see where that is. Could you just point to it on the map there of the development, right where you just mentioned? Um, yeah. And, the and, first piece. Or you can't see it there either? Uh, well, I, yeah, I, I don't have it up on my screen, but I, I can see on the other screens. The city of Las Vegas piece is there's an L-shaped piece. So there's a vacant okay. lot uh, and there's an L-shaped piece uh, which starts uh, south of Vegas Drive and south of, uh, forgive me, it's hard to read the street names, Peach, uh, Pebble Peach Boulevard Drive. Oh, good. Oh, okay. 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 I see that. Thank you. Um, so there, there's a there's a call out box. Uh, Your Honor, excuse I also me have one a second, Councilman Coffin. Yes, please. Hi, I I don't have anything in writing on this uh, on the proposal from the developers. Uh, at five minutes after eight, they did send me something, but we have a hard time printing it, and I wondered if there's something that we can look at uh, from them. I see all these things being uh, transmitted here, so there might be a must be a hard copy somewhere. Uh, Mr. Arndt from, sent out information well, on talking, this, correct? about stuff from McDonald and... Three, four days Frank. ago. Uh, yes, Councilman, I sent you a briefing on the project yes, last Thursday. Yes, I got your briefing, and it's a very good briefing, but what I'm saying is I asked for additional information from the people who are promoting the project, and um, it was sent to me at 5 after 8 this morning, and I've been trying to print it. We just have a hard time printing it. So I just thought they must have given us something in writing to show us what they propose to do, what they propose to do. We, we do have a written proposal. Uh, it did, the project did evolve over time. Staff and the developer went back and forth with discussing what would be best for the project. So uh, we do have something in writing from uh, Frank Hawkins, who is uh, a consultant to the developer. Uh, but because it's not accurate regarding the final project and how, we're, how it's being proposed to be phased, uh, we didn't want to present that, but uh, if the developer does have something, maybe what we could do is I could finish my remarks. I just have a few more remarks, uh, and then we'll let uh, the developer okay. uh, present the project and, and go Thanks, over Thanks, Bill. Project. Thank you, Your Honor. Sure. I think, and they were um, continuing to work on clarification of some issues. So I see that half of the developer team is not quite here. Um, is he on his way? My own. Okay. Michael McDonald, Vegas 1 Decatur, Vegas Decatur 1 uh, LLC. Uh, he's just walking the door right now. Oh. Also, ma'am, there's okay. also some, there's some uh, and Councilman Coffin, uh, I probably, we just got some language that uh, we just, just five minutes ago, we need to also review that if I could. Okay, uh, that wonderful. Came, came from the city. We just Thank got you. From the city, so. Thank you. And what we'll do at this point, if Mr. Arndt, you want to conclude, and uh, good morning, Mr. Hawkins. Why don't you have a seat? Let Mr. Arndt conclude, and then we'll go forward. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Councilman. Uh, so you see the site before you. There, there, there are two parcels that are called out: the City of Las Vegas piece, which is an L-shaped parcel, and then the parcel which is marked RDA, which is an acronym for Redevelopment Agency or City of Las Vegas Redevelopment Agency. So both uh, part, the city and the RDA 
uh, own those two properties, and that is the subject parcel, uh, which is under consideration for development for this, for this project. Uh, the developer, again, I mentioned that there, there are three phases uh, for the project, and the developer is seeking some assistance from the city uh, for the project. And I remind you that it is proposed to be a mixed income, including low-income units. So it is customary for the city to support these projects with some assistance. And the developer has asked for assistance as follows. The developer is seeking a 75-year uh, land lease for a dollar per year for both the city parcel and the redevelopment agency parcel. There are some conditions attached to these leases, which I'll cover in a moment. The developer is seeking $3,919,000 in grant funds through two of our funding sources, redevelopment agency set aside and home funds for phase one construction. And then other funding sources for the project proposed are $7.1 million in investor equity from low income housing tax credits. That's private equity generated from the state's low-income housing tax credit program, so that is not city money. And then a deferred developer fee of $221,681. The phase one total project cost for those 60 units proposed is $11,264,913. Uh, when we do uh, have a proposal for selling or leasing land below fair market value, there is a state law requirement that sales or leases uh, demonstrate that the, in order to accommodate the transaction, the below market value sale or lease has to meet one of two public purposes and, and an exemption for either redevelopment or economic development. Uh, if you do proceed with approval, uh, it is in the staff, in, in the documents that it would meet both exemptions since it is owned by the redevelopment agency and it is uh, would further economic development. The redevelopment agency's uh, parcel, the 6.1 acre parcel, was appraised uh, recently, just this past month. We have to do two appraisals, so they're independent appraisals hired by the city. Uh, for the appraisal values were a million sixty thousand and nine hundred twenty thousand. So that's for the parcel that is situated adjacent to Decatur Boulevard, and then the L-shaped piece that I mentioned, the parcel. Uh, that is owned by the city of Las Vegas uh, is a 3.34 acre parcel and it was appraised at $410,000 and $390,000. We do have a heavy sunk cost, so whether we proceeded with this project or any project moving forward, the city does have a heavy sunk cost in the project and I'd remind the council that it, this is something that the city typically gets involved with. We typically do buy property in struggling areas with the goal of reinvesting in the areas. So we do have a very uh, heavy sunk cost, but I wanted to disclose that since this is a public hearing. Between the acquisition cost uh, for the city land and the redevelopment agency land, as well as a small amount, $400,000 for environmental remediation, we have a little bit over $8.1 million invested into this site. Yes, uh, Councilman Beers, please. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, so when you say sunk cost, I'm just trying to understand this is essentially money that the city's lost city taxpayers have invested in it's gone we I mean well but the market value of this parcel is what the the I just covered the market value determined by the appraisers so the uh, the value is roughly uh, under a million and a half for, and, for both right and so this is why most developers that have been in this valley for the last 20 years aren't in business anymore because of the massive drop in, in property values around the valley. Um, so this money, the $8 million, it doesn't seem legitimate to consider that a cost of this project. The city's already lost that money. The, 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 the property's worth what it's worth, right? I, I would agree. Okay. I would agree. Thank you. And Mayor, Mayor if I may. Councilman, um, Councilman Barlow. To, to hear the term loss, I just want to clarify that. Um, and thank you, um, uh, Councilman Beers, for bringing that point forward because I don't want the public to be misperceived as far as the city um, went into negotiations of this development deal and uh, sunk money into a development that flopped. That, that was not the case. It happened to be at the time in which the city 
purchased the land and we were uh, moving through a development to revitalize a depressed area at a time that no one in the valley knew what was going to take place from the market position and so property values across the state plummeted and so it wasn't as though we made a bad deal it was a matter of the market basically came from off on, uh, came from under our feet as a whole as a state so I just want to be clear in that respect. Thank you both. I think those are both important points to understand and hear because we have been caught in this. And Councilman Coffin, please. Yeah, I just <clears throat> wanted to say that there's, it's, I don't think it's a quibble, but it's probably worth noting that the, uh, the money's not lost. I mean, this, uh, it's sunk cost. It's an unrealized loss, theoretically, until you do this deal, then it will be lost. But I think if you have a chance to sell it, for a higher value then, or higher use, whatever that is, then it may be a loss, but they may not be a loss. So it isn't lost, for sure. As, as a councilman here will, will agree, it's not lost money yet. Thank you. And Councilman Beers? Thank you, Mayor. This may be a difference between government and private sector accounting standards, interestingly enough. What is the criteria for impairing an asset? Uh, and under financial accounting standards, this loss would have been recorded already, and this asset would be carried on our books at the market value. I don't know how governmental accounting standards would treat that, actually, and it may not have, it may not record that loss, but under financial accounting standards, this would have been recorded already. <clears throat> Thank you. I don't see. Um, and Ms. Fretwell, any comment to make to that, please? Actually, I, I don't have that information with us um, as to how it shows up on our books uh, and whether or not we've recorded that loss um, at this point or not. Uh, but it's certainly something we can explore and report back to you in briefings next week or later this morning if you prefer, Mayor. Um, I think it would be the wish of the council, whatever they wish. Uh, you know, for I think it's a fact and it's interesting and of importance how we've carried it on the books and how we expensed it out. But I think as far as this particular issue and this consideration before us, um, one is about us and how the city's operating financially and in a particular item of value. But I think as far as bearing whether to go forward with the item before us or not, it's not relevant. Thank you. Ms. Starnt. Uh, thank you, Mayor. And one last salient point to make on the land purchase, and uh, this is, I think, consistent with the remarks by the council. We did make the purchases some time ago. We bought the redevelopment agency parcel in June of 2000, and we bought the city parcels, the L-shaped piece, in December of 2002. So it, a lot of time has elapsed, and obviously the market was very different then than it is today. Uh, and so uh, whatever transaction we proceeded with, uh, we, I think, likely would potentially be facing some kind of loss. And uh, one other question, if I might. The L piece that the city owns, uh, was that purchased in support of the RDA's purchase? Um, because what use does that skinny little L shape have without the RDA parcel? Uh, that's a good question, Mayor. When we look at a, a site for potential acquisition, uh, one of the criteria is we look at neighborhoods which are struggling potentially, and that land uh, was underutilized, and it was adjacent to the parcel. It's not immediately contiguous. There's a street, uh, but we did use uh, uh, low-income housing set-aside funds, and we were looking at long-term maybe a potential for mixed-use commercial and residential projects. So uh, it, it was... It, the acquisition wasn't made at the same time, but we recognized that for us to really have a meaningful impact on the neighborhood, we'd have to figure out something for both sites. So uh, moving forward, uh, we are recommending denial on this item, and I wanted to just summarize the reasons for the basis of denial. Uh, the first is that uh, the development entity, uh, is, which is wholly owned by Mr. McDonald, does not have sufficient experience in developing affordable housing. Uh, and uh, he was a partner on a prior development agreement where the project did not proceed, uh, and we actually, as the city and the redevelopment agency, terminated that agreement in December of last year. Uh, I think the next two reasons are probably more important. Uh, it's staff's determination that uh, the front piece, the, the, the portion that was marked RDA, is better positioned long-term for commercial development. Uh, as you saw in the aerial, picture. 
This once was a shopping center which was functioning. Uh, for a lot of reasons it's not. There, of course, it's vacant. Uh, and there was a piece that was sold off to HJEE LLC, a limited liability company, uh, for the potential development of a Marianas grocery store. So that's one indicator of the development potential for commercial. And then the, this, the third bullet there is that the subsidy per unit, and I, I need to point out something, that this is exclusive of the land cost. So I would agree with Councilman Beers that it's, it's probably not appropriate to consider the city's sunk cost in the land. Uh, we'd have that no matter what project we'd proceed with, uh, and that's not really the responsibility of the developer. That was the responsibility of the city and the agency. But excluding the land costs, that $3,919,000 of subsidy, when you uh, attribute that to the units that we're pay paying for, essentially buying down the, the cost for, is the affordable portion of the project, not the market rate. The affordable portion is 40 units. So you spread that subsidy over the 40 units, and that, that's a subsidy per unit of just under $98,000. Uh, we think that, we believe that to be higher than other projects that we funded that have also received funding from the state's low-income housing tax credit program. And so that's the additional reason and basis for denial. Uh, there is also an additional concern although it doesn't pertain to the first phase, that we don't have a budget or uh, sources of funds, proof of financing for those future phases. That's not to say that the developer could not find sources, but today that has not been presented. Uh, there are some conditions. If it's approved, we have built in some uh, significant safeguards to protect the city and the redevelopment agency's interest in the land. I want to cover this real quickly. Uh, the grant funding, the, those two funding sources and the ground lease are contingent on the developer securing state tax credits by September 1st of 2012. Uh, it is, uh, doesn't match up exactly with the award notice. The award notice happens somewhat sooner, but it does take uh, the state some time and their staff to put those agreements together. Uh, so that is this funding round, which is c coming up where applications are due in May. So that would, uh, we'd know whether or not the developer is successful fairly quickly on that. The uh, phase one construction, the, the 60 units must start within six months after the tax credit award. Phase two, which would be developed on the RDA piece, there are three contingencies, uh, all of which we think protect the redevelopment agency's interest in the land. The first is that phase one has to be completed. The rest has to be a certificate of occupancy. The second is that the developer has to make a capital contribution of $1.8 million. There are some utilities and infrastructure which both the city and uh, the prior developer had put into the site, but there is some additional site work needed to finish that, as well as the money needed to build the capital cost of the project. And then finally, we recognize the value of a restored site. The uh, piece where the RDA owns and the piece which is owned by HJEE LLC, uh, which was proposed for the Mariana store, uh, we think that that site would be better developed long term if it were one site, if we could restore it as one site, whether uh, the city and the re through its redevelopment agency owned it, whether the developer owned it, whether a third party owned it, we think it'd be better developed as one site so we get a, a better project, whether it uh, be the project being proposed today or some other project. Uh, so we have asked the developer to make a good faith effort to acquire that site. The, the, the third party would have to be willing to sell. We recognize that we can't force them to sell but we have asked them to make an effort. I would mention that there is an employment plan required for all the phases because it's city land and redevelopment agency land. We have both employment plan policies uh, as part of the, the project. So in conclusion, there are actually five items that are related to this item I'm presenting for redevelopment agency item six, which is the development disposition and development agreement, which also contains the land lease or ground lease for the phase project. Uh, and I stress it is phase, so the uh, we would control the project in phases. There is a resolution that meaning that, that the sale, the lease, excuse me, the lease meets that redevelopment or economic development exemption. Uh, the allocation of funds, there is an error in the uh, agenda item for item 59. Uh, and while you're not, you haven't called that item, I just wanted to point out that we incorrectly stated in the agenda item and the backup documentation that there would be $3.5 million, $3,500,000 in redevelopment agency set-aside funds and $1,119,000 in home funds 
the item should have read $2,800,000. And that was a staff error. It was not an error on the part of the developer. We were looking at increasing the amount of home funds and decreasing the amount of redevelopment agency funds, and that was just an error that we didn't catch before we submitted backup documentation to the city clerk. And that's in relation to item number 59? Item number 59. Okay, Correct. so uh, we'll be sure to bring that back forward at that time. Thank you. Uh, item 60 is similar to RDA item 7. I'm sorry, RDA item 6, where uh, the council has to approve the DDA. And then finally, the city council uh, has to approve an, a resolution for the purposes of meeting Assembly Bill 312. I do have some uh, changes to, to read into the record. There was some late backup that I want to submit now to the city clerk. Uh, the first is something that is not part of this contract proposed with the developer. It's simply a staff policy where we do an impact analysis of what the public pers purpose being accomplished is with the project. So for, uh, for uh, redevelopment HC item 7, there's a public purpose impact analysis. There's also the city employment plan policy, which uh, needs to be part of Exhibit E of the Disposition and Development Agreement, which is the item for consideration here. Uh, and that was missed by staff. So we would like to add these two documents into the record and I'd hand that to the city clerk. Uh, there, also are some, there also are some proposed revisions to section three. Uh, this is a new change that staff just worked on last evening, working with the city manager's office and the city attorney's office. Uh, I would uh, note to Mr. McDonald that uh, he has not had a chance to see this. So he is unfortunately seeing this for, for the first time as you are. Uh, but I do have copies of that, and I provided just before the hearing a copy of that as well. Uh, one of the questions that had come up uh, with staff is uh, what happens if the project comes in under budget proposed by the developer? Uh, so that uh, would all of our grant funding be needed for the project? And there was uh, uh, an effort with staff to try to minimize the amount of grant subsidy, to only, give only what's needed for the project, uh, so there is some language that we're proposing to add in Section 3, uh, and I'll, I'll read that real quickly. Proposed revision of Section 3, lease agreement between City of Las Vegas and Vegas 1 Decatur LLC, entitled Term Option. Modify heading to reflect Term Funding Option and insert the following as Section 3B. The City subsidies referenced in this Section 3B are predicated on the tenant's ability to obtain long-term housing tax credit funding for the development of Phase 1 Vegas 1 Decatur Apartments. The city's combined funding subsidies, $3,919,000, which represents the maximum percentage of the city's contribution, equates to 34.79% of the total development cost, $11,264,913. Should the total development cost decrease, the city's subsidies will decrease proportionately and not exceed 34.79%. Should the total development cost increase for any reason, the city subsidies will not exceed $3,919,000. Therefore, any increase in the total development costs must be borne by the developer and funded by either deferring a higher amount of developer fees, which shall not exceed 60% as allowed by the 2012 Qualified Allocation Plan, QAP, for low-income housing tax credit projects or obtaining permanent financing. Uh, what I just read into the record basically is saying that our money would proportionately go down with the, the equity to be generated by the tax credits as well. And again, that's only if the project would come in for lower than the cost proposed. Uh, this is the latest uh, cost estimate that we have from the developer. So if it came in exactly as uh, indicated, then this provision would not apply. It would only apply if the project costs came in under budget. Uh, with that, again, staff does recommend denial. And I be glad, glad to answer any questions and then also turn it over to uh, the developer, Mr. McDonald, to make a few remarks regarding the project as well. Thank you, Mr. Arndt. We do have some questions up here, but we need one, two more copies, please, of B1, um, Section B, Executive Summary. We need one, two more copies of that and we have everything else. Please. Okay, so you're missing both. You take one of each. And then this one um, is missing. In fact, I'll give you Lois's. Here's an extra one. Here's an extra of the three, yes. of the whole? Okay. Could you pass this down? I will give Councilwoman mine. 
those, that's your third piece. Oh, this is the third. Those are the third, so we need one more. We need one more of the third, please. Um, you both have everything at this end. How about Councilman Beers, Councilman Ross? Yes? Okay, we just need one more for Councilwoman Tarkanian of this, please. Okay, um, Councilman Anthony, um, you're first up, and I know Councilman Coffin has some questions. Thank too, you, Mayor. Uh, Bill, um, I just want to ask a couple of uh, just two questions on a matter of policy. Uh, th this particular piece of property is uh, it's a tough piece of property. I mean, part of it is owned by the city. Part of it is owned by the redevelopment agency. Part of it is, is owned privately. So it's, it, this is a tough area to develop just for somebody to come in. So kind of that, I mean, that's an accurate statement, correct? Yeah. Absolutely. And, and it, it is a, it's a, it's a blighted area. I mean, it's a, it's a tough area. It's, it's uh, causing deterioration of the neighborhood. So that is kind of our responsibility is to go into those particular neighborhoods. So it, it is, it is really, as a matter of policy, it is appropriate and it's really necessary for us to partner up with a private developer to go into this particular area and help develop it to make it better. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay. And, and the, uh, the second part is the, the 3.9 million that, that's being um, um, uh, requested for this particular project. Uh, the use for that 3.9 million is appropriate for this particular project. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay, thank you. Mayor, I'd like to uh, ask a question. I'm so sorry. Yes, Councilman Coffin, please. Okay. The, um, just a couple simple ones. I'm still trying to digest all this stuff. Um, Bill, the um, monies that the city is stewarding, responsible for, but not necessarily putting out general fund, it's uh, what, uh, almost $3 million in redevelopment authority set-aside funds, which come from property taxes, um, and um, 1.2, let's say, in HOME funds, which I guess is something left over from the Community Development Block Grant. It's federal funds some in some way or another. Is, is that right? It, uh, it's similar, but it's a different pot of money. The redevelopment agency set-aside funds, those are the funds that, by law, 18 percent, the first 18 percent of every dollar we take in is set aside in a separate bucket for low-income low income housing. It has right. to be 80 percent of every median income housing or below. So that money is reserved for, for housing. The home fund, it's a similar fund. It has different criteria, but that is money that is actually, uh, we get some, two pots, one pot from the federal government, from Department of Housing and Urban Development, which happens to be the money that's being proposed today. There is also some money received uh, directly from the state. Okay. Uh, but they're, they're two different funding sources, but both have to go for affordable housing. Okay, so that's $4 million of, of money that we're responsible to spend wisely. Uh, yeah. The question is, uh, well, there's one, several questions, and I'm not sure I know them all, you know. And maybe as we develop this and then also move into the council meeting where this, I guess every item here is going to be considered at council, too. The, uh, I'm presenting on redevelopment AC item six, but I think depending on the outcome of this item, I think that would guide the council for the remaining items. So that's Correct. why it, I listed them out. It's just that I want to make sure we have to vote on every item at council. You do. Okay. You do. Uh, the, um, the, the these monies, I, I understand they they have to be spent sometime. I don't know when. Are we going to lose any of this money if we uh, don't spend it immediately? Uh, today, we're not at risk of, of losing either funding source. Uh, the redevelopment HC, actually, we have a lot of latitude. There isn't any expenditure deadline, uh, so we could, we could let that money sit if we wanted to. Of course, mm -hmm. we look for good projects to invest in. The home funds, we do have a, a rolling expenditure deadline. Uh, right now, today, we're actually uh, fine with that deadline, but uh, we manage that on a recurring basis to make sure that we're meeting the federal guidelines. Uh, we do have some reallocations later on unrelated to this item which are designed to help us meet that expenditure deadline. Uh, but whether you approve or disapprove that this item today, uh, that's for staff isn't the deciding factor for allocating the funds to the project. But we potentially could have to find another project for the home portion uh, that's being okay. considered for the project. Then the next question would be is, um are we required to spend any of this money or all of this money on new 
units of residency, whether they be multifamily, single family, or uh, can we use, acquire existing uh, units, residential, multifamily, single family, uh, for low and middle income people? Uh, the answer is uh, no, we're not required to use it for new construction. Uh, in this market, as a policy, we've done a lot of work on the other side of the market, so to speak, where we're looking at the existing supply, trying to renovate it, rehab it. We have a lot of programs and a lot of money going into that. Each year we do allocate a portion of our federal grant funds for new construction. A uh, logical question asked then is, well, why are you building new units with so, much, so many units on the market? There is one segment of the population, the, the senior population, uh, that is underserved. We have studies that are on file, uh, in particular from the State Housing Division, which quantify that need. So there is a need for new product. Uh, so each year we do look to use a portion of our funds for new construction. This would be one of those projects if it were approved. Uh, and we have a, a, one other project uh, that's later on for today that's also a tax credit project that's asking for funding. So we do uh, do some new construction, but to answer your question directly, the money could be used uh, for uses other than new construction. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Um, Councilman Ross. <clears throat> Thank you, Mayor. Um, this is, I have to back up a little bit a little here. This used to be the edge of town. Western High School was the last high school on the edge, and many of us remember that. Um, You're showing your age. I know I am, but I think it's, it's important to show my age. Uh, this was the Wonder World site. I mean, I worked at Big Five Sporting Goods when I was a kid. I mean, I've seen this neighborhood. I grew up in this area. I know it very well. And as I continue to drive by this area, it bothers me that nothing is happening on that parcel. Um, I'm glad Councilman Beers brought up, you know, the loss uh, issue. In the private sector, this would be a loss. We write it off, we move on. And I honestly believe that's where we are today. Do we have money invested in this parcel? Absolutely. Both as the City of Las Vegas and both as the Redevelopment Agency. But nothing's going to happen there unless it comes from us. I don't see a whole lot of people knocking our door down to build something there. Um, those neighbors, that neighborhood, and those surrounding areas deserve something. I've heard talk and conversation about, well, gee, we'd rather see some commercial there. How long did it take Councilman uh, Barlow to get Bilo Market to where it is today? It took a long time. I don't see it happening. I do see the city in a position where, yeah, we got a bunch of money invested in this thing. Are we going to get our money out? You know what? Probably not. Let's move on. I think, uh, and if you can answer some questions for me, uh, Bill, should this be approved and we move forward, are there protections for the city of Las Vegas? I mean, performance protections, performance triggers. Why don't you hit on those for a minute for me, if you would? And the mayor, then, Mayor, I'd like to continue my questions. Uh, sure, Councilman. There are protections built in, and uh, that's why the recommendation was written up. If it is approved, uh, we do have conditions in the agreement. Uh, it's one of the reasons we use that form of the agreement, the disposition and development agreement, instead of just doing an outright lease, is we want to control the development. And that's common uh, for all of our projects. So we have the control of controlling the land. Uh, the uh, lease, they actually need to execute the lease to submit to the state for tax credits. But there is an automatic termination provision if the tax credits are not awarded for this project. So if the tax credits are not awarded, the, the development agreement and the, the subsequent lease are actually terminated. So there's a built-in protection there. Uh, if the tax credits are awarded, there are performance deadlines for the first phase. I mentioned the six-month start. There's an 18-month window to finish it. And then uh, maybe more importantly, and that was maybe staff's major concern, is that front piece, uh, it's, it's a challenge site right now because there's fragmented ownership. So we wanted to make sure we could get as quality a project whether you would like to proceed with this project or any project, get as a quality of projects as we can on that front piece, the piece that fronts Decatur. Uh, so we have a lot of protections in to make sure that that happens on the front piece, uh, which I mentioned, uh, I think it was just two slide, one slide before. So those were the, the conditions for the, the second phase. So we have built in a lot of protections. Uh, we are still recommending denial for the reasons I listed. But if you do approve, we are safeguarding the city's interest in the property. 
Thank you. Councilman Ross, you wish to continue? With your permission, Mayor, thank you very much. Um, Mr. Arndt, I understand that uh, when Mr. McDonald created this new uh, company to, to, to do some, something on this parcel, they'd met with you early on and, and you worked with them. Uh, I mean, several months had gone by. Uh, and then Mr. McDonald brought Mr. Hawkins on, which lends a great deal of credibility. He's got a history of, of developing uh, affordable housing projects throughout the valley. Uh, I know this from our experience, my experience on the Housing Authority, Mr. Hawkins, uh, four years spending time there, understanding the system and how it works, and all the great things that you've done. Um, at what point did you finally tell these guys that you don't support and you're going to recommend to the City Council that should, to, to not approve this? Uh, I, I don't have the exact date in mind, but it was uh, prior to, uh, I guess it was probably prior to or concurrent with submitting it to the, the clerk, uh, so it was within the past few weeks. Uh, one of the concerns was the development entity, that uh, the contract is what it is, so we had a concern that Mr. Hawkins was not part of the development team formally in the agreement. I would concur with you wholeheartedly. Mr. Hawkins has an excellent track record not only in this community, but with this city. We funded a lot of Mr. Hawkins' projects. He builds very quality projects, and he has a very good track record. And I'd like to put that on the record. But we did have a concern that if uh, the project was delayed, if there were future amendments that needed to be made, uh, he was not formally a part of the development team. Uh, I understand there are some technical reasons why, and I'll let uh, Mr. McDonald and Mr. Hawkins cover that, but that was a, a concern of staff. Well, Mayor, if I may, again, uh, there's been controversy and criticism of the fact that both of these men are previous city council members. I mean, it is what it is. They're still members of this community and businessmen, nonetheless, who are trying to do something in this community, number one, to make a dollar, number two, to do something that we need. And your statistics in regards to the aging population, we have a huge amount of baby boomers, 10,000 a day, Re reaching retirement age, thro age throughout this country, that is quite significant. Who cannot afford to live with their Social Security retirement or any of the other retirements that they have? So I think we, as a policy board and policymakers, need to be cognizant of that fact and try to afford opportunities like this, whether they're previous city council members or not. They're still members of com this community and businessmen nonetheless. Um, the triggers that you put into this agreement, they protect the city of Las Vegas. These men have to perform or nothing happens. And it's still our dirt that we've got a ton of money invested in. I mean, that's never going to change. That's the facts. But if we don't give them the opportunity to perform, shame on us. I think we've got to have something there. I think you've worked very good with them. I think you kind of maybe strung them along a little bit and then told them no. Um, which probably might not have been fair, but I think there's a good reason for that. You looked at the numbers. The numbers don't jive. The numbers don't work out per unit, and, and that's totally understandable. But we've got to cut our losses and we've got to move on. And we've got to think bigger and better for this community, uh, for Councilman Barlow's ward, and for our aging population. Um, so I'm going to support this. Uh, I'm going to support this project, Councilman. I don't know how you feel about it, but I think uh, these guys need to be given that chance. I think the city of Las Vegas is well protected with these triggers. Uh, Mr. Hawkins has got to perform and get these tax credits or it's, it goes nowhere. So I think I'm willing to take that risk. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Councilman. I think it's time now, if we could, um, to hear from uh, Mr. McDonald, Mr. Hawkins. But please do state your names again for the record. Thank you, Honor. Uh, Michael McDonald. Vegas Decatur 1 LLC, the developer, <clears throat> with no experience. Um, one thing I'd like to point out is that uh, this is important, and some of the questions that were raised by the, by the Mayor and Council uh, throughout our, our, our efforts to, to communicate with you. A lot of the catches, as you just brought up, Councilman Ross, we put in there. We were the ones that said, if this doesn't, we don't make the, if we don't make the cut, we'll go away and cut our losses. So we know what's, what's on, your, on your shoulders right now. We know the commitment that the council, that Councilman Barlow has for the community. That's why it was important. Uh, a lot of you know I'll, this is my community. I, I have been fighting for, to have this. This is a commitment to my neighbors, and it's something that really has to be done. And as many of you looked at the numbers, it's definitely not for the profit. Definitely not. So I went out and got the best uh, developer I could find that knows this in, inside and out, that knows the numbers inside and out, and has a 100% track record. Uh, he's part of the community. 
He is a pillar of the community. He has been fighting for less fortunate uh, a lot longer than I have. Well, not a lot, but as long as I'm, I follow in his footsteps. That's why it's important. It's important to have someone with such, uh, such credibility that this will get done and that you have confidence in. So with, uh, without further ado, Councilman Frank Hawkins. Good morning, everyone. I'm going to move over, and I'm going to try to be done in 10 minutes, okay? So if we could go to the over you have to turn on that mic, right? Yeah, it's good. And let's turn yeah. off the others. So, so I don't know if they put up a site plan, but if not, I'd like to sort of walk you through uh, what we're talking about. Uh, the, the site we're looking at is Westmoreland and Lawrence. So we, you guys can't see it. Do you have? If they'll go back to the overhead of the site plan in the back, the PowerPoint. The PowerPoint. Go back a couple slides. Okay, well, thank I, you. I, I, uh, if I could ask for the overhead, I think it, so Mr. Hawkins could show the site plan. That was not in my PowerPoint. If okay. the, the back will go to the overhead in the center, center of the console. Thank you. Okay. Um, the, the site that we're talking about that we're asking per staff, which they uh, recommended to now, and we'll ask, of course, asking for approval, is for Laurel Hurst and Westmoreland, 60 units along this side. Phase two is going to be, you got it now? So phase one is, is the 60 units, 10 single-story buildings. Phase two would be a four-story building, 72 units. Phase three would be 64 units in a four-story building. And just to give a little history, we originally started on, on this site, which was originally 11 stories, when Michael came and asked me if, if, he could, if I could help him. I said to him, let me look at it. It had a fire station in it. It had some commercial in it. And I basically said, if the goal is to build affordable housing, we need to take everything out. So we went back, took it all out, um, redesigned it, and came back to the city. We had a subsequent meeting with about 10 people, uh, including staff, and we presented our performer for phase one. We presented our letter from our lender uh, for this project, and we all left saying, everything's great, let's go forward. The following Thursday, I got a call from staff, said, hey, we want you to come in and meet with us. So I did on a Friday. And staff said, we don't want you to do this, which we already had architects and engineers working. We'd like you to come back and do this phase first and make this phase one. That particular time, we had less than 60 days before our deadline. I went to Michael and to uh, Bain, the partner, and said, hey, look, staff wants us to change this. Um, engineer and architects would have to change. I don't think it's a bad deal. And working in the spirit of cooperation, let's go for it. Well, uh, Mr. Bain argued that, no, this was not a good deal. and, and this was another change, and he didn't want to support that. Um, as you heard, I, we were all perplexed a few weeks ago uh, when staff said they were going to recommend denial, in as much that we had worked this far and come uh, collectively together. Uh, we worked with them on the agreement, as been stated by both Bill and Michael. So this is what we're asking for. We're asking for the lease. We recently received an appraisal of the property, as has been stated as well. Um, a week and a half ago. Microphone. Nope. There you go. A week and a half ago, and we requested that we send an email and asked if, since now you have a value, um, could you include the language giving us an option to purchase? Uh, we have not heard back on that option, but that is one of the things that we would like uh, as the motion is uh, made and discussions go forward with the councils that we have the option to purchase the land. Uh, they did two appraisals. Uh, we'll pay, which is required, the higher price. Uh, we have no problem with that. Um, I would like to take a few minutes to discuss um, comments in the staff report, only because I think it's important for the record. Um, unfortunately, some media folks try to slant it and sway it one way but I just want to put the facts as I know them on the record. So um, project recommendations. So the staff report, if you guys have the staff report, 
the, the first thing that I see is under the recommendations, recommendations for denial. So if, if, and then they say is that Michael doesn't have or hasn't hired the experience. I think Michael is committed to the project. We know that because he stuck with it. So many other developers have walked away in this valley, but Michael has not. He's been committed. Came to me in the summer of last year and said, hey, I need your help. Um, we were wanting to be a partner in the deal. However, the state, through the QAP Qualified Allocation Plan, the last hearing made some changes, which only is going to allow X amount of tax credits to go to any one developer. We have another project that we're doing in Henderson or Clark County uh, that did not allow, because if we won two, they weren't, would not award the tax credits to us. So that is part of the reason. But I am a consultant to Michael. We have gone further than anybody else I know in a consultant standpoint. For example, we've moved forward and have the plans approved. So there's been an investment to, from, through the architect and engineer to have the plans through express plan check pre-approved. We have the letters from the lender and the investor. If you guys approve this item today, we have the other two components, the home and the RDA. And, and I like to separate the two because they are different. The RDA funds, as was stated here, is 18% set aside. Now, based on the new law, 9%. But those funds have to be spent on affordable housing. So I would ask the question, how much RDA money has been given to any other tax credit development? And I suspect that answer is going to be none. So if you lump them, because this is a mixed income, mixed use deal, you, we're mixing the different sources of financing to build still an affordable housing project. There's been discussion about can you buy other single family apartments, houses? Yes, you can. And I would just say that we know you can, but it hasn't happened. We're here pushing a project that has real dollars invested in on everybody's side to say, give us an opportunity to perform. Stated earlier, if we do not perform, if we do not win, then we have sunk costs. I have sunk costs. So without belaboring my point, we've built 14, over 1,400 units, over 12, 13, 14 tax credit projects in the last 10, 12, 14 years. Uh, we build single family, multifamily. We do uh, rehab. We have a property management company. We have a general construction company. So the, the concerns that staff have about not having Michael, I will say that he has hired the consultant that has all the pieces. So as much risk that can be reduced in the development process has been reduced. Uh, on, uh, under can, Excuse me, uh, Councilman Coffin? Yes, thank you. It's on the last statement, so it's just a right appropriate. Uh, Frank, are you bearing any of the risk? Uh, oh, sure. Are you, yes. are you a partner? No, I cannot be a partner. Oh. But it's my intent to be a partner in the next phases. Oh, okay. Thank you. Thank you. I'm a consultant on this phase. Councilwoman Tarkanian, And please. as you said here, you're not a partner because of the fact you had already applied for those tax credits for another project you have in Henderson. And this would be a second project, and you cannot do that according to law. They would not award it. If they both won, they still would not award. Right. And I've met with the state, and we've gone round and round. So that's so why, that's why you can't be a partner now, but you intend to be a partner as soon as this is completed. That's correct. And we have all those aspects in place that I mentioned when I met with staff uh, to make sure that we have a deadline, because this has been going on a long, long time, that we have a deadline. And if it's completed, then we move forward. Just wanted to clarify for listeners. Okay. That's all. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Councilman Anthony. Thank you, Mayor. Um, uh, Mr. Hawkins, I, I know you, it's been mentioned that you have a lot of experience in this area, and, and uh, but just for the sake of the public, um, I, I know it was mentioned you were a former city councilman. That was a long time ago. I think you were running back for the Oakland Raiders. I'm not going to hold that against you. Um, <laughs> but uh, you, these 14 projects that you've completed, they it's my understanding they were all successful. Are those 14 projects similar in some fashion to this particular project that you have 14 of experience in? Yes, sir. Okay. And uh, the second thing is I know Bill mentioned that uh, senior housing, this type of housing is needed in our community. 
just from your expertise, is that a correct statement? That, that is correct. And besides the state doing their own independent study, of course, which I agree with, we also, as a part of submitting our tax credit application, have to have an independent third party do a market study. And I've submitted to you guys some pages of the 150-page market study shows a demand of some 553 units per year in our section that we're talking about. Okay. And, and if, if this is approved today and the rest of the pieces fall into place, you're ready to start construction and build this thing, correct? That, that's correct. Our plans are an approvable state other than paying for the permit to pull the, the permit fees. And we would negotiate uh, our documents with our lawyers and our investor and our lender, and we would be under construction. Thank you. Uh, and one other question, looking at the uh, tax credits from the state and the timeline that are triggered, um, you are able to meet those to the best of your knowledge. Yes. Uh, we, we work with bill staff and, and um, as Michael said earlier, to craft a lot, a lot of this language to, again, make them feel comfortable and, and of course, keep us on the hook. But, yeah, the timelines don't, don't worry me. Even uh, the document that we just got, um, I read it. It's, it's not a problem because what, what you learn in this business is that it takes a lot of people to work together to build affordable housing. It's complex. There's many layers of financing. There is a million masters to serve. But the end goal is to build affordable housing because it's needed. And I know it's been a long time on this project. It irritates a bunch of people. But hopefully a year from now, we'll all be out there cutting the ribbon, saying great job, and we're glad we moved forward. Well, your track record of 100% is hard to argue with. So please proceed. Thank you. Um, the, the next, if you go to uh, second, another statement that staff says that they thought that the highest and best use was not for uh, housing. However, if we could go back to the overhead, I'd just like to make a couple statements. It, it was... Since 2005, microphone. Wow. Since 2005, um, there's been a commitment to, to put housing here. So, the the challenge, in our opinion, if it was it's been good enough since 2005, why is it now 2012? It's no longer good enough to have housing. We understand the dichotomy of the challenge site. However, this property for a commercial site it's not very viable because you don't have very much frontage. And, that, and when they put the bus stop in here, which is going to be required by RTC, you're going to have little or no frontage. So hopefully one day that this can be acquired and build some housing here. But clearly, if you're not going to build commercial, then what is the next best thing? And we think that our project is. Uh, The staff talks about uh, a grant contribution that equates to 97975 I didn't quite understand that. I did my numbers in backwards and forwards, and I didn't know how they got to that number based on the $8 million or based on the $3 million, nine, but I, I couldn't get to the number. So um, they, they also went on to say the contribution is two to three times higher than the grants that they proposed before. I w again, I would say you've got to bifurcate separate the RDA and the home and not collapse them because the RDA is totally separate, separate funding than the federal home monies. So if you do that, then you're using the mixed income, so the RDA money to help build housing, and you're using the home money to fill the gap. And that is standard across the board. So it's all in how you look at it and how the writer writes it. Um, so again, uh, staff said, and this was, goes to, I think, Co Councilman Coffin's question. I mean, I just had a simple question. If staff position is, why hasn't the city purchased uh, any apartments or homes with RDA funds? According to this document that we read, uh, there was uh, apartments purchased for 5222800 That was for these units on Lowerhurst and some 40-plus units. Now, I would profess that uh, the city is not in the business of building houses or apartments, but they are the conduit to ensure that affordable housing is constructed to the greatest of their ability. And they exercise that by what is called a comprehensive CHAS, 
that is submitted to HUD every single year. And I just wanted to make, make that clear for uh, the record. But again, redevelopment in this area was included in the redevelopment for a purpose because it was starting to become blight. The goal was to help try to sustain, stop the downward spiral, as Councilman Ross has stated. Um, in 2000 and 2002, it was articulated that the city bought the combination of these parcels. So that's 10 and 12 years without any uh, development. Granted, there's been an effort, no lack of effort on anybody's side, but uh, we believe that uh, this effort today uh, will generate some housing relatively soon. And my last comment about redevelopment. When we look at the purpose and why it was created, and we say if we're going to spend $2.8 million in redevelopment funds, so now you are leveraging $2.8 million to build 196 units. So now whatever that cost was, they say 97000 goes down to some $14,000 a unit. So redevelopment is doing what it's supposed to do, You're using it for phase one, not for phase two or phase three, but if you get phase two and phase three units, then that's a benefit. Again, it's how the writer or how person wants to look at it. Staff goes on to talk about the, um, the fact that they've spent 8522000 purchasing the land. Again, I, you guys had a discussion when I was coming in about that being a sunk cost. And I agree wholeheartedly with Councilman Beers because the way we do it in the private sector is it's a sunk cost. And if you, you build something, you got what you built, and long term, you've cured a problem, a blight that you had and you wanted to eradicate. If not, you continue with that blight, and these shopping centers, these shopping centers on the either side of the development will continue to suffer, and then they will close, and then that becomes a blight. So building some housing gives these businesses, these retail businesses, some customers, and hopefully will strengthen their business and encourage their growth. There, uh, now I'm going to move to the, um, there's another statement right before the agenda items that staff said the developer did not present any evidence of funding for phase two or phase three. And I just want to set the record straight because originally this was our phase one. And we did, in fact, submit the letters from the investor, from the lender, a complete performer, with plans and everything to staff. Staff subsequently said in a meeting the following week, can you move here? And we dropped, stopped what we were doing here and created the same plans, the performa, got a letter from the investor, a letter from the lender. So just for the record, I want that to be clear. So under the uh, agenda items for city council consideration, um, item six here today, that I, I just would like a, a point of clarification because when, when I talked to Bill about uh, the $1.8 million um, capital contribution, I was led to believe, and I could be mistaken myself, that there had been a $1.8 million investment by the city. And uh, from land that was purchased here and sold, uh, and development costs for the old uh, or the Mariana's grocery store. So I've asked for uh, checks from both uh, the prior developer and the city so that we could resolve the issue. Because if there's money due to the city, then I think the city should be paid back its money. Um, and so this $1.8 million clarification, if, if staff is saying, I just want it on the record, that this 1.8 is an investment that you're putting back into the deal. I have no problem with that. But I was led to believe, I thought that city had hard money out of their pocket in the deal. So Bill can maybe clarify that and later. Um, so if I, I may, I, let, okay. it's all right with you sure. if you respond now, okay. I think, while it's right on point. Please, Mr. Arndt. Sure. Uh, to answer the question, it was related to the transaction with the private developer. 
Uh, we had an agreement with the prior developer dating back to June of 2007. It was amended four times. Uh, we were trying to make the project work. I think the amendments show that. Uh, one of the things that we did was uh, we allowed the sale of the Marianas piece. Uh, if you recall the site plan that Mr. Hawkins showed, it would have been on the, the top right or the, the north, uh, the northeasternmost portion of the site. Uh, that's not part of the transaction today. That was sold, uh, as I stated earlier, to HJEE LLC from Alpha Omega Strategies LLC, the prior developer. Uh, prior to that, we sold the property to the developer. We, our sale price uh, was approximately, let me find the exact amount, was $1,304,611.11. The developer sold the parcel to HJEE LLC uh, for the Mariana Supermarket, which did not proceed for $3,100,000. Part of that was by design. Uh, we took our sale proceeds, which was really getting part of our original land investment, we took that, we invested it into underground utilities and infrastructure with the hopes of supporting the grocery store. The developer did take a portion of their proceeds uh, and put it back into the site as well. So uh, we do have some money into the site. Uh, it was just reinvesting our sale uh, proceeds. The developer did too. Uh, from the prior agreement, which was terminated, there's not any money owed. Uh, but the site isn't completely improved. There are additional improvements that are needed for the global site. Uh, so that was the basis of staff asking for the capital contribution. Thank you. I could, as we... Uh move through, I have no more comments on the um, items for council consideration, but I would like to have you look at the uh, public purpose impact statement that we passed out and I think staff passed out as well. Um, because when we originally talked to staff, we talked about a lease. And uh, the item uh, before you today is, is regarding a lease. As I said earlier, we made a uh, request verbally and by email that we be allowed the option to be able to purchase uh, both sites um, for the higher of the two appraised uh, values. Um, we would ask that uh, as we move forward that hopefully that language can be in included uh, within the uh, agreements. Question there, would you not proceed if it were not included? No, we would proceed either way, but I just think for the, the discussion, uh, we would have we have no problem purchasing the land at these prices. Okay, thank you, Cal um, Councilman Ross. Mr. Hoggins and Mr. Ron, with that thought, and Betsy will probably gets you in this in this conversation as well. If these guys buy this property, and certainly not for what it appraised for when we bought it originally, because of the the property values, but they buy this out from underneath us at a higher appraised value right now, Mr. Art or, or Ms. Fretwell. Um, they can do what they want to. They can do what they need to do on this property to, to do whatever it is, and that's out of our hands. Am I correct? Uh, Councilman, I think the answer is it depends. If you want to just sell it outright without any development requirements, uh, then we'd be out of it. Uh, but if you wanted to make the sale contingent on all the other terms in the agreement, which I think is what Mr. Hawkins is suggesting, I think that does put the city in a better position. Unfortunately, the timing of submitting documents to the clerk, we didn't have a chance to change out the lease to a purchase. Uh, but I, it certainly it's, it's a better position for the city. Uh, and it would, uh, if it was a sale at the higher of those two appraised values, then that would eliminate the need for two of our agenda items today for those exemptions. Yeah, I, I see. If I may, if I'm with your permission, Mayor, uh, I see that. But I also see number one, we want to protect protect the city. We recognize that we've already got a chunk of change in this that we're not going to be able to recoup. We certainly want some type of development right there. We owe it to the neighborhoods. We owe it to those businesses in that in that shopping center that are still there. What's the best case scenario, and how do we get there? We got a fish on the line here. I want to reel them in. If I might weigh in, Mayor Betsy, 
Brother, Council, please. Over here. Um, I, I just want to say that, you know, one, we have not looked at um, the language that would allow a purchase option. I, I'm, that was mentioned to me for the first time today. Uh, and so if that were something that you all really wanted to consider, it would probably be something we would have to look at in light of the entire deal. Um, what we presented before you today, and as we've briefed all of you, if you choose to go forward with the project today, um, we feel the city's in a very secure position. Um, with the sale, uh, we would have to really look at those um, restrictions associated with the sale for performance. And many of you have indicated your desire to see the performance um, as we've uh, briefed this project over the last, I can't even tell you, untold years. Uh, and so, you know, my sense is, is time short. Uh, they've got a filing deadline. If it's the council's desire to go forward with the project, uh, I believe, uh, Frank, it's the end of this month, right? Like next week that they have to submit. So. I think it would probably delay the project to deal with a, a lease purchase option or some sort of sale option. Um, you know, obviously, if we went forward with this um, today, that's something that you could direct us to try and work out an amendment to include an option for that later. But I, I really think it might slow things down if it's your desire to go forward uh, to try and weave that in today. That's thank that's you, Miss Frith. Well, because that's why I asked the question. If you're willing to go ahead, then we can go ahead and proceed with that and the language acceptable or not, but separated it out. So at least you can move forward because you are on a timeline that is very tight. And so if you would speak to that and we have it on record, that we could work on that language and that would come back to council for further consideration separated from this today. We, we would like to move forward as it's written today, uh, add the lease option and then deal with staff. That's what I was just talking to Bill about. And I think another caveat is if, in fact, we win the award of tax credits, which we believe we will, then if there's a 90-day time period to exercise the option to purchase, that works fine. But we, we are on a tight timeline, and we don't want to do anything that will interrupt. Great. Okay. So let's uh, deal with this in, in the unit of itself at this point, then, with yes. your permission. Great. And then let me just, let me close um, by just saying I, I'm not here to dispute the history of what's happened. I, I know that, um, you know, there's, this project is tough, but in redevelopment areas, they are tough. Um, and I just want to, again, say I know that Michael McDonald is committed uh, to building the project, and I'm committed to helping them ensure that it's built. The, the last thing I'd like to address, though, is the issue of attachment B. Um, because when I talked to uh, some of the council people, there were concerns about um, the cost. And then again, just for the record, when if you could go to the overhead, when, when we were looking at this site, yes? This one, I believe. This one here? Oh, on that uh, spreadsheet. It says attachment at the top. Everybody have it? Council, do you have attachment B? We have A, the, the, okay. This one? Uh, section B, executive summary. Nope, no, this no. one here. No, we don't have it. We're missing this piece. Maybe if you could put it on the monitor there, we could at least see it, then we can all get copies after. Can't see it too small. Okay. Staff has it, okay. Um, th there was some concern about cost. Again, when we originally started working at the project, we started with this 11-story building, reduced it down to four. We had the meeting with, with staff and the councilman, everybody agreed. So we had the engineering done, we had the soils report done, we had the phase one, we knew what the dirt was, we knew where all of the, the uh, underground utilities were. When staff says, would you move, and again, I agree, so I just want to make that clear, that we agreed to move, we didn't have any of the soils or the phase one. We have power poles that we don't know what has to happen. 
We have laurel hurts, which we don't know if we got to widen, if we got to repay. We have sidewalks that we may have to demo and add back in. We have an alley that we don't know what, what has to happen. So when we start talking about cost, a performer is a pitcher in time. So when, when I saw this sheet that says, okay, you got 187000 I also submitted to you guys, per the tax credit uh, requirement, um, says project development information, section 38. And on section 38, it states that, and this is a HUD requirement, that the maximum per unit cost for a project uh, compared to the Nevada Housing Division maximum cost per unit is $204,500. So I know some people said to me, well, Frank, you know, you, you're, you're at 187 and we have other projects that are substantially lower than yours. And, and I said, well, I can tell you, when you don't know what you're dealing with, it's a little hard to give a price. Vertical construction is pretty simple. It's sticks and bricks, and you know what you're going to do based on the square foot, and you've probably done it before. But site conditions are entirely different. And I've said to Bill and others that uh, once we get the soils report and we know what we have to do, once we get our uh, plants back from um, uh, Nevada Power and uh, Embark and Southwest Gas, then we'll know exactly what we have to do underground. And, and they've written this in this one-page amendment that they did that we say if it's less, they want to stick to a percentage. I have no problem with that. I have no problem with what staff wants to do because I think their long-term intent is good. My only challenge is, again, when the report gets leaked to the press and people don't have all of the information, they start insinuating and they start character assassinations, which I don't think is fair or correct. So I look at the number and I'm going to, because I don't know that these people want their names of their projects shown, so I'll just block them out. But we have a project here. Let's just take the one, second one at the bottom here, second one from the top. It says $5 million. That is the total project cost. Then they said, okay, they got $3 million in um, tax credit equity. Can then you they slide, have, excuse me, could you slide? Oh. And I'm not sure it's going to your right. You want to go over. There you go. You, there, you got everything Yes. There? A little okay. bit further, you don't need the white paper. Keep going the direction you were, and up a little bit, and then we're in business. There you go. Oops, right. too far. Come down. Just There you are. Great, right. thanks. So we're looking at this one. Oops. $5 million is what they say the total project cost is. And $3 million in tax credits, 997 in city funds. If you take these numbers and add them together, we're looking for sources. They're saying what the cost is. It doesn't total the $5 million. So I'm going to come down to one of our projects. So you come here, we're talking about, they say $11 million. Well, on the tax credit equity, they have $2 million. That's not correct either. But if we added the numbers across, $2 million plus deferred of 221 plus $3,919,000, that's not going to get you to $11 million. So... My point in just looking at this chart is to say, if we're going to compare, we need to compare apples and apples, not oranges and apples. And I, I'm going to read this, and I'm going to be complete. So regarding staff numbers, the numbers don't foot. The total project course, cost and the sources do not tie. So their tax credit awards in some places are not correct. We're talking about cost. Cost can be measured in different ways. So I would ask, could staff explain how they arrived at all these different costs? Because cost takes research. For example, are we measuring things such as the hard costs versus the total development costs, which we should, because if I build a two-bedroom apartment that has two bathrooms, it's going to cost me more because i got another hookup than if Bill builds a two-bedroom and he only has one bathroom. If I build that two-bedroom and I have a washer-dry hookup in the unit, it's going to cost me more because I've got to pay for that sewer connection. And if Bill doesn't have that in the unit. So the cost can be arbitrary. And unless you know what you're trying to measure, then you're guessing. Uh, purchase price of the land versus discounted price of the land. We're talking about having one at least at $75 for 75 years, or we're talking about a purchase. Well, that's going to drive the overall cost. Do we know that? 
And then if we don't, do we, if we do know that, do we know what the cost is? So we have to break that out. That's not done. Some developments have all of the infrastructure already done because they have built a phase one or a phase two. All they're doing is building vertical. So others have to put in underground utilities, water, sewer, power, adverse site conditions. None of this is noted that I could see. All I see is a, a lump sum number. Is it prevailing wage or non-prevailing wage? Has an impact. Are sites master metered or individually metered? All of these questions have to go into measure. What is the billable square foot versus the total site square footage? So just throwing out a number doesn't work. And I'll close by saying this. It's like a bike. If we look at three bikes and they all cost different amounts, could we say which bike was better if we didn't know all the details and what went into the cost? Frank, I have a question on this point, Your Honor. May I ask that question? Please. Thank you, because I want to stay on point. That's why I have to interrupt you. Your point is uh, you're quarreling on the cost per unit numbers. Actually, I didn't look at that number on that spreadsheet, uh, which I got on Monday. I looked over at the subsidy per affordable unit, and I don't know whether or not they must all be affordable. But on the other hand, um, the subsidy number was the one that struck me at nearly 100000 per unit versus most of those others, which range anywhere from, let's say, 10000 to 20000 per unit. One of them is 41000 So that may be why that was illustrated to us. It could be arguable on the cost per unit. And, but, uh, and that could be an arguable number, of, but I'm sure. looking at the taxpayer subsidy of the, of the uh, Councilman, uh, you talk about the 97 $97,975 per unit. Yeah, I don't know how they arrived at that number. Well, that, I'm assuming it's accurate. It, it is quite possible, though, that, that there is arguable that the $187,000 cost could be an arguable number. It could you be. Know, but I mean, based upon exactly the things you said. But right. Councilman, thank you. I don't um, know whether I, anybody could argue with that. Um, Councilman, I believe uh, Mr. Arndt would like to address the comment, please. Uh, just real quickly, the, the subsidy per unit, the way we calculated that is we looked at our subsidy just from the city, not looking at the other funding sources, the $3,919,000 divided by the number of affordable units, which is 40, generates a per unit subsidy of 97975 mm -hmm. Please, Mr. Hawkins. Not correct, because all the units are affordable. So you'd have to go to 60, at worst case. And then if you're looking at the one-time subsidy, and we're going to build 196, then you should divide 196. Again, all in how you look at it. Correct. Thank you. Um, I would like to admonish the uh, council here. The attachment B has been passed out to you with the project name. So I would appreciate it when you're through with it, either tear that off or return them all and shred them because that was not the purpose of the um, exhibit. Okay, public document, public uh, project. Ma Mayor, if I, if I may, uh, our, our staff generated that document, so any questions concerning the document, I and my staff would be glad to answer. Thank you. It's a public document then, so it's all right to keep it. Okay. Okay. Yes, thank you for the correction. What, and could we go back just to this phase one? Uh, what percentage, I know you gave us other figures, but what percentage of phase one is low income housing? Councilwoman. All of it? All 60. Oh, I thought when this was presented, I must have misheard. I thought that they were saying part of phase one was uh, low income housing medium housing and then no but every single one of that is low income housing right the definition okay. of affordable housing is 80 percent and below right the definition of low income housing is 60 percent and below the definition of poverty or low low is 30 percent and below okay thank you thank you Mr. Uh, Mayor, if I could just comment, uh, and I appreciate Mr. Hawkins' statement on the record and his intention. Our contract, it's my understanding, does not limit the income limits for 20 of the 60 units. Uh, and 
certainly, you know, we could look at that in, in some of the amendments that we've discussed today. But it's my understanding that we were just contributing to the 40 units. That could have been a miscommunication uh, between uh, my team and Mr. Hawkins and Mr. McDonald. So we can certainly look to clarify that in any future amendments. I think, Madam Mayor, that that's where I got confused because it had been presented to us a little differently. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Arndt. This is a public which I declare open and anyone from the public who wishes um, to make comment, please make sure your microphone's on. State your name for the record. Thank, Thank you. you. Todd Farley, 240 North 19th Street. I just want to make a comment on fairness. When Mr. Arndt presented the reasons for denying this thing, there was something on there, and I just, on passing, I just caught it, that it says that they missed a payment or something like that. And just in fairness, if this country is going to bail out these thieving bankers for $760 billion and they're going to and hit the reset button on them, then they're going to have to reset the button on the developers too. I mean, you have to look at, at every project as, in, as what is, is there before you at that time, not what's going in that real estate collapse that we had before. Thank you. Thank you. Um, anyone else wishing to be heard from the public, please come forward. Councilman Barlow, this is in your ward. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you, Council Members, for your comments. Um, Mr. Arndt, <clears throat> from a, can you explain to us the uh, purpose for a redevelopment agency briefly? Certainly, Councilman. Uh, the main purpose is to reinvest in distressed neighborhoods experiencing urban blight. Uh, we do that through any number of ways, uh, but it's try to try to encourage new private investment, new private development, and also create new jobs for the community. And as it relates to the redevelopment agency, as we bring money into the agency, what portion of that uh, is set aside for affordable housing? Prior to October 1st of last year, 18% was set aside for affordable housing, it was defined, Mr. Hawkins was correct, at 80% area median income or below. Subsequent to Octo October 1st of last year, uh, the state legislature <clears throat> changed it, so now 9% uh, is set aside for affordable housing. And uh, by law, can we utilize the affordable housing dollars outside of the redevelopment agency? Uh, we, we cannot, for our commercial, the 82% are now the 91%. We can use the set-aside. There isn't a, a restriction to use that within the redevelopment agency boundaries. We've tended to do that, uh, but the law isn't, isn't, isn't explicit in whether we have to use it inside or outside on the set-aside. For the majority of the redevelopment agency dollars that we spent, have we used the majority inside the redevelopment agency or outside the redevelopment agency? I believe the majority has been in the inside. You're correct. Okay. Uh, secondly, uh, home funds. Um, are you familiar with home funds? Yes, I am. And uh, the home funds come from which agency of the government? The U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development. So that would be the federal government? Correct. And the portion of home funds to be used on this particular project is in the amount of what? One million one hundred nineteen thousand. This. Are you familiar with the state tax credits? Yes, I am. And what portion of the state tax credit uh, will be coming in um, proposed for this development? The, uh, let me refer to my notes, apologize. The uh, equity generated from the tax credits is proposed to be $7,124,232. Okay, so on this particular project, we have federal dollars, we have state dollars, and we have municipal dollars to do a redevelopment project and um, as it relates to the uh, redevelopment area, how is that established and why? The, uh, what we typically look at when we use our dollars for a project is we like for our housing money, whether it's... Well, let me stop you there and rephrase my question. How does a redevelopment agency become established and why? Uh, the redevelopment agency is established by a county or a city. Uh, the sitting uh, elected body, uh, the city council, serves as the board of directors for the redevelopment agency. And for the purpose of what? 
for the purpose of uh, and that the council enacted the redevelopment agency, the redevelopment area for eliminating blight, getting new development, new projects being built. Have we worked with other private and nonprofit entities similar to the applicant before us today? Uh, we have worked with a lot of nonprofits. Uh, we, I don't know if we've worked with any that with Mr. McDonald's background, but we have worked with a lot of different nonprofit housing developers. In relation to affordable housing developments? That is correct. And have those other entities utilize federal, state, and local municipal dollars in order to pull their project together? Yes, they have. Okay. And at various levels? Yes. Some more than others? Yes, that's correct. According to the State Housing Division, what element of the community lacks affordable housing moving forward? The senior population and uh, does the, lack housing. The senior population and the project before us today is looking to build what? There, it's a phase project. The first phase, it's my understanding, would be housing which is targeted to seniors but not age restricted. Uh, so it would probably be uh, 55 and over. Uh, but then to be age restricted to comply with federal fair housing law, you have to be 62 and over. So it's my understanding that phases two and three would look to do that and be age restricted. Uh, phase one is a little bit more fluid uh, in order to proceed with the tax credit application. But it would be fair to say that the population that we're looking at are those baby boomers moving into seniorhood. That, that's correct. Okay. Um, you mentioned built-in protections. Uh, I know the month of June is a trigger point, and uh, what's taking place in the month of June as it relates to, this, to the state tax credits? It's my understanding that uh, interested parties have to submit an application to the State Housing Division uh, next month, and then initial award decisions will be made as early as June. We included a date in our contract of September 1 to give time for the, the paper to exchange hands because once the awards are made, there's a lot of uh, paperwork, as Mr. Hawkins knows, to go back and forth between the award winners and the developers building the projects. Should the applicant before us today not receive the state tax credits, what happens to this um, deal or contract before us today? The way we've written it is the development agreement and the lease would terminate on September 1st. Okay, and should they receive the tax credits, the other trigger point, I believe, as you um, stated in your presentation today would be that the applicant would have six months to start construction. Is that accurate? That is correct. And should the applicant not start the construction within that period of time, what happens to the contract or the applicant before today? Then we could uh, default the agreement and then subsequently terminate it. Okay. So having said that, uh, in addition to the um, number that has been uh, put out in the community as it relates to the, um, the subsidy um, and the total amount of the project of 180000 per unit. Um, you were calculating that based off of the 40 units? The, the total cost, I believe, is per the 60 units. And then the subsidy, uh, because uh, we're looking at 97975 for the 40 units. So, And, and so you divided, lo looking at your math, I'm just basically questioning, um, and I, I did some simple math here myself, out of, out of the city's funding of 3919000 right. divided by the 40 units is what you came up with as far as the $97,975 subsidy per affordable unit. Is that accurate? That's correct. How many units are being built on this site? There are 40 uh, income restricted units and then 20 which uh, would be mixed income, which we did not describe what the income limitation would be. And that, are that's there what any I city, Are there any city funds for the 20 units? It's my understanding on the agreement that we reached and what's before you today that there, there would not be. It would just be for the 40 units. And that was just reached today? No, that was, that's in the agreement. That's what we've been working on. With uh, a mixed income project, uh, typically what you see is for the tax credit projects, a portion of the units are income restricted. Uh, those income restrictions are as tight as they get. 
The, in order to receive the tax credits, the IRS actually requires extensive reporting. So those units are audited and monitored arguably closer than any affordable housing unit in the country. So those 40 units are very closely monitored. Our agreement didn't prescribe the income limitation for the 20 units. So that's why we had uh, targeted our investment, the 3919 into the 40 units. So how can we target our monies for 40 units when in fact the development has 60 units? H how do we carve out our portion for the 40? We know that the 40 units have to be at 60% of median income or below. Our funds have to be either at 60 or 80% of median income or below. So we know that our, our requirements for both the set-aside money and the home money would be met, would be satisfied. Okay. Mr. Hawkins, did you have a comment before I continue? Briefly, please. I would just like to say, uh, and I'm looking in the DDA and in the lease, and I think it specifies that they're all affordable. Our, our performer states that they're all affordable. So at the very least, it should be 60 and not 40. So if, in fact, that is true, then the calculation of the 97000 um, for affordable unit, uh, affordable housing per unit, if you, if all 60 are affordable, then the calculation would bring that 97000 down to $65,316.67 per affordable unit if, in fact, we're basing it off of your, comment, uh, your, your presentation here today. So it's not 97, it should be 65,000 as far as the city's per unit subsidy. My understanding is that we're subsidizing the 40 units. I'll go back and review the agreement and speak to staff, but that was the, my the understanding. Why it sounds like out, there is a, the only reason why I point that out is because someone leaked to the media that um, the going back to the 180,000 per unit, when in fact right here from the state, which I did my research, and the and from the state, the uh, project de development information states that the cost per unit, and this is the Nevada Housing Division, this Nevada State Housing Division states that we can, uh, per unit, uh, can go up as far as 204,500. And so if we're at 180, and if, and if in fact my calculations are right, um, versus your 40, and the 60 that I believe are all affordable in which the applicant has just stated, then this number would not be 180. You have to subtract approximately 30,000, which brings it down to approximately 150,000 per unit. No, that's not my understanding. The total cost is what it is. If you apply that over 60 units, that's the cost. You are correct that the state has that policy of a total cost per unit cap. I think the question becomes, Councilman, and I would certainly seek input from you and the rest of the board as a matter of policy do you want to look at the amount of funds that are under the city's discretion and look at underwriting a project and look at the subsidy per unit? May I, may I weigh in real quick? I think Please. Mr. Hawkins did a very nice job of outlining that some of these projects are very difficult to determine comparables to that degree. The reason why this, there's a, a decision before this panel today, before our council today, uh, to make a determination about whether or not what is before you is a reasonable subsidy for the outcome that you want on this parcel of land that the city owns. Um, I'm not asking you today to give us policy direction about what is the right threshold because I believe Mr. Hawkins is correct in saying that different projects have different levels of development, that is correct. different individuals that they may be serving, and different stages of development on those parcels. So I just want to be really clear that we are not asking for direction about what is that, what is the appropriate level. If you would like to have that conversation, we can bring an item back. Uh, but we have presented to you today one that shows a level of investment, obviously being debated right now about how it's calculated. Um, but nonetheless, really this is about this project and whether this subsidy is sufficient or not sufficient or meets your uh, direction for the level of investment I, in this kind of project on this site, given the considerations of this site. I, I can appreciate that, um, Ms. Fred Will. Um, however, it was presented today in a presentation, and so I, I need to make sure that we touch on that because I don't want the public 
to walk away with misinformation specifically as it relates to the numbers that was presented here today. I'm not asking staff to come back with a policy decision. I just want to basically touch on some areas that I find to be very pointed because information is out in the media that is inaccurate. And so I want the accurate information going forward, being that we have the applicant as well as staff here before us today with all of the facts, and some of the facts appear to be skewed, if nothing uh, less. Uh, having said that, um, this project, Michael, um, go, dates back to 2005 um, under uh, former Councilman Lawrence Weekly. I assume this project will, as a matter of fact, Councilwoman Tarkanian had it for a moment. And due to redistricting, um, I assumed it. This is a project that um, the mayor and council um, has been standing behind for a long time. And it goes without saying that um, a lot of us, to include myself, are quite frustrated with the, all of the nuances that have gone on with this project. Um, from the lawsuits to, to the delays and what have you. Um, that's not to say that we don't believe in the project. It's that we would like to have had the project built just as I'm sure you would have a long time ago. Um, and so for that, there's a lot of emotion tied into this project, a lot of emotion for yourself being that this is the community in which you were born and raised and a community that has a long standing of residents in my district that have been living there for 60, 70 plus years. And um, something that uh, a development that they've been looking for for a very long time. Today, this community um, in the redevelopment area is blighted. And it was a specific reason why this council chose, um, I believe back in 2006 when we uh, allocated this area in the redevelopment area for to bring up this site specifically. And there was no one knocking on the door um, at that time. And only uh, a few people now uh, even uh, are remotely interested in speculating at this site. Um, we've been working with you for a very long time on this development. Uh, from my perspective, um, the city is not concerned, or for our staff is not concerned with um, the RDA set-asides, because that's what we do. The redevelopment area is just that. We basically uh, pull up blighted communities in order to bring them back into the market for the sake of improving the quality of life and the aesthetic uh, lifestyles of neighborhoods. Um, home funds, state funds, it is a very complex deal. No different than what we've done downtown with the new city hall that we're in today. We deal with very perplex deals all the time. We dump a lot of money from the RDA into projects all over uh, the downtown community. And uh, as I mentioned to Mr. Arndt and, and Betsy and, and Scott Adams, it's time now to start spending some money in the neighborhoods, specifically in those outlying redevelopment areas. Because we've done a great job, and we continue to do a great job in the downtown. But as the councilwoman would know, because we're working on some plans now to expand the redevelopment areas in Wards 3 and Ward 1 because of some of the corridors that are um, becoming blight or are blighted today. So we have to start spreading that money out. So as far as I'm concerned, as it relates to the redevelopment area, that's what the redevelopment dollars are for, to get inside neighborhoods and bring those neighborhoods up to make sure that they're livable, once again, reactivated. We can't just concentrate on one area of the city when it comes to redevelopment. That's why we established it out at 1501 Decatur, to basically bring it up. So now we have a question that comes before us as far as the city spending too much money in an area. We can go and purchase um, 140 homes in other parts of the city um, that can house individuals. Yes, we could, possibly. But what does that do for 1501 Decatur, an area that has been designated since 2006 for a redevelopment project. No different than the other developments that we did, whether it be buy low market and the monies that we had to spend through the RDA in order to attract a grocery store inside of the historical West Las Vegas community. No different than the monies that we used out here in Symphony Park in order to have these beautiful edifices that we have currently here today that we can basically celebrate and tout. But what about the neighborhoods? We can't 
run short-sighted as it relates to the RDA because the RDA is there to basically make sure that there's a balance of equitability across the board. So I'm very passionate when it comes to lifting up communities because I represent a community that is very unique. We have a lot of residents in the areas of wards one, three, and five, residents that have been living in these communities for 80, 90, we even have 100-year-old residents in our communities. And they've been paying taxes a very long time. How, do we forget about these neighborhoods? Of course not. We need to have individuals who's willing to step up and do what is necessary. And I really want to thank Councilman Ross for his comments because he's right, he's dead on. We can't allow neighborhoods to fall while others grow. That's, that's an imbalance of city governance. We have to keep it across the board and do all that we can to basically create the rich historical cultures of these communities, specifically for those residents who have been living there all their life. We can't forget about them, and I'm not going to forget about them today. And whether it be the media or any other pundits out there in regards to why we're spending the money or, or, or suggesting or recommending why we're spending the money we are today, it's because this is the community that I was born in. This is the community that I chose to represent to make sure that our communities in these older areas continue to receive our fair share to keep a level of equitable, equitability in place in order to preserve these rich historical communities. We can't forget about our residents, and I'm, I'm not going to sit here and allow that to happen, not on my watch. So if that means I have to spend a little bit more money in order to bring up a blighted site, then so be it. But that's why the redevelopment agency is in place to do that. That's why the set aside, that's why the federal government has allotted 18 percent set aside for affordable housing projects so that we can provide that carrot in order to bring up communities. So the question is not the redevelopment area and the dollars that we spent. The question is the fact that Michael McDonald hasn't produced anything. And so that's why staff is, is you, you, let's just put it out there. That's why staff is, de, uh, is moving for den denial on this. And I understand that. But one thing we have to give Michael McDonald credit for is the fact that he went out and sought a developer who has a track record in Mr. Frank Hawkins who has done project after project that has come in under budget and on time. Does he not, Michael McDonald, get credit for that? I think so. I think so. And so with that, Mayor, um, though I'm going to conclude my comments and, um, and I'm ready for uh, to cast a motion uh, today if, in fact, my colleagues uh, don't have any other follow-up comments. Councilman Coffin has a comment. Thank First, you, Mayor. Please. I'm just curious if any other council members are perplexed by the lack of information on this. I literally just got this information from the uh, applicant, just um, actually not incomplete until we sat down here on the floor. Uh, I've never yet met with them, but I know that they tried to meet with me yesterday, but I wasn't in the building. But Frank, I've been around here now for nine months, and I know that some of the members here are, are well, very conversant in this project, but I'm not. And I, I know it took me months and months to try to figure out the City Hall, Zappos, RGG, uh, three-way, four-way, five-way transaction. This is pretty complicated, but you have to have some history, and I didn't have any history on this. And so, you know, I feel like uh, I'm trying to absorb a whole lot in a few minutes. Um, I would like to res um, just respond to it, Councilman, and, and with no aspersions cast here, but I know in the briefings that you attended and our other council people that we have regularly for us before we come to our council meetings, that this information and the dialogue that was continuing between Mr. McDonald and staff and Mr. Hawkins, of course, this, um, my first meeting on it was way back, I'm going to say six, seven months ago when the first denial came through. And so I think there has been an effort on their part just recently to bring in more information. 
and my only hope had been that as you had your briefing that we could have known in your briefing that um, the information wasn't complete to your satisfaction because I really do think with them uh, both of the um, gentlemen your Honor, well, your Honor, before you, us I, I doubt that you're trying to take responsibility for me not getting information but because I directed the question at Frank and Mike because I'm sure you wouldn't want to assume that responsibility. I did get last Thursday the email from our staff, which customarily comes in the week before our meetings, and it, it gave the staff's opinion and the five or six reasons why they had an opinion. But I have never heard from the applicant. Okay. Would you ever. care? Did you want to respond that, to that? This was the first time. I Councilman, uh, to my knowledge, uh, we reached out to you last week. I know Michael talked to you on the phone. Uh, the only new information that you have today is the market information from other meetings and city council folks said, hey, you know what, show us that there is a need for this. So the market information is new, probably new to a lot of people who hadn't seen it uh, prior to today or our meeting. The other document that we gave was a staff document. That document would be the impact analysis, saying that they did two appraisals. We gave it, they gave it to you today. Um, so there's no information that you have from us today that has not been submitted to staff. And I would just hope that during the <laughs> briefing that you got a full briefing. And if well, there's Michael, anything uh, we Frank, submitted. Michael reached out to me on yes, mon Monday afternoon at 3 o'clock. I got back to him yesterday around 4 or 3. I forget. I was on my way. Well, we so started He said he couldn't explain the project that you could. Right. We started meeting last week. And then finally week. I got a response from you at 8 o'clock this morning, but that was, I tried to print it out. Yeah, no problem. But it didn't contain any of this information. It contained some plats, some illustrations, some elevations. Well, that's why it's so important to try to meet so we could explain. There's no All way, right, nothing I could have sent you. I didn't have a chance to meet with you comfortable. because you didn't ask for it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both. Councilman. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Council Members. Um, let me just say this in conclusion. I'm not trying to come across rude to you, Bill, in your uh, presentation. You did a wonderful job with the presentation. And one thing that I can really appreciate, appreciate about uh, your presentations, specifically in briefings, is that um, the way in which you operate, you're not a rubber stamper. You give it to the council, rough, rugged, and raw. You give us the good, the bad, and the indifference, and you allow us to make the decisions. So your recommendation of denial uh, is to be commended because you've done your job. And I can appreciate that as a professional because that's the type of feedback that I look forward from all staff, including my own, as far as don't rubber stamp the things that I say. I don't always have the correct information. So if you provide me the good, the bad, and the, and the different, it gives me an opportunity to evaluate them all in order to make an educated um, uh, vote moving forward. So I want to say thank you for that and for all the staff members as well as the city attorneys who've basically been working long hours all the way up to early this morning when I got into the office at a quarter to seven trying to basically prepare uh, in addition to the amendment that uh, you all brought forward here today. So I do want to say thank you for that. Um, Michael, we got to get it done. We got to get it done. There's, there, there's, I'm just going to conclude with get it done, get it done. So with that, I'm uh, going to move to um, move for approval. I, do I approve this item being that staff is recommending denial? You, you move for do approval I deny of staff denial. You, no, you don't deny. You move okay, for so approval, move of, for the approval item. of the item. Your, your subject to all conditions. Yeah, subject to all conditions, including the amendment that was presented this okay. morning. Okay, I just want to make sure that I'm voting the right way. Um, so I'll be voting um, in favor of moving this item forward, subject to all conditions, to include the amendment that was forwarded from staff today. Purchase language. I'm sorry? The option to purchase has to be considered, or you're going to slow it down, has to be considered later. I would prefer not to include the option to purchase because you all are walking a very tight rope and okay. contingent upon what we've already dealt with within the last 48 hours, I would say let's move forward and then basically bring a, 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 
a future item forward to, a, to, to make any adjustments. So at this Thank point, you. I'm going to move to follow a staff, uh, well, my recommendation, not staff's uh, recommendation, but my recommendation for approval of this item subject to all conditions to include the amendment. That would be my motion today, Mayor and Council. Thank you. And is that acceptable to Mr. McDonald, Mr. Hawkins? Yes, Your Honor. Thank you. There's a motion. Please vote. May we speak on the motion, Your Honor, before we cast our votes? Uh, I, I will do that. Just, just, uh, just briefly, please. Your Honor, you've done this before. You've suggested that I limit my remarks before I vote, and I think that uh, it's inappropriate to do that. Uh, I do not intend to speak a great deal of time. If you want to watch your watch while I do it, you can start a timer. No, 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 I, I wasn't being rude. It's just you've had the, the opportunities before, and I respect you, and I respect your opinion. I think everything you bring to us is part of this, but we have been here now an hour and a half, and we have a long agenda for the rest of the day. It was not in any rudeness to you. It was just a point to move it on and it wrap wouldn't it be up. to me. It's just the people that we all represent, Your Honor. I feel like... Um, I, given a complex project that I haven't seen before, I'd probably abstain. Given my gut feeling based upon the fact that our staff has explained to the best of its ability that they do not think it's a good idea, and for all the reasons they've, they've, they've stated, then modified by what I've heard from the applicants today, which softened some of the criticism of staff, I mean, that helps me. But on the other hand, it's a complicated issue, Your Honor. It's one normally I would ask for a deferral on, or I think in many cases this council would ask for an abeyance, at least for a couple of weeks, so you could study the new information that was just put in front of you. So I uh, try not to delay you, uh, but just simply say that I think the price is too high. I think the basis of the land is so high that I think staff is correct. They're the professionals. They say commercial is a better use. I know their, their comments have been criticized because uh, by people that feel like commercial is not a greater use, but this hasn't even gone out to bid. It hasn't even gone out to bid, Your Honor. Remember that. So it's something that we really have to pay attention to. Because I know that you're not irresponsible. You're, you came in here as a, as a trustee of the public money, and so did I, and so I feel like, for many other reasons, I guess I won't take the time to explain right now. Maybe we'll discuss it in council when this has to come up again for a vote. I'll have to vote no. I have no choice. I think your points are always well taken. They should be a matter of record of what you feel and how you feel as ward representative. That's critical to our people and the whole community. So at this point, we have a motion on the floor. If you will all please vote. And please post. Uh, Councilwoman Tarkanian would like to make one wrap-up, but I'm going to tell you the motion has passed, and we congratulate you. And we thank you, Mr. Arndt, for the efforts, time, energy that if you put into it with your staff, and it's been a long time, Mr. McDonald. You have a very tight line to follow with these dates, triggers, so you better not go to bed tonight. You just get working on this. And Councilwoman Tarkanian, please. I just wanted to say that... Uh, Time is there, it is limited, and the people are losing patience. We are, all of us up here, you know, Michael, very concerned about how long this has taken. So I expect you to have a great finish to this and have a great help for our seniors who need uh, housing at low cost. Thank you. And there is an item number seven, which we are going on now to please, uh, which is connected, I believe. This is RA 52012, discussion for possible action regarding a resolution finding the proposed disposition and development agreement between the City of Las Vegas, the City of Las Vegas the Redevelopment Agency, RDA, and Vegas 1 Decatur LLC for vacant land located along Laurelhurst and Westmoreland Drives and 1501 Decatur Boulevard to be in compliance compliance with the furtherance of the goals and objectives of the redevelopment plan, Ward 5, Councilman Barlow. This item is related to RDA item 6, which we've just heard, and Council items 5960 and 64, R-35-2012. Uh, Mr. Arndt. 
Thank you, Mayor. Staff had recommended denial, but subject to the approval of the last item, staff does change its recommendation to be consistent with the vote on the prior item. Thank you, um, Councilman uh, Barlow. It's a discussion item and open to the public. Oh, open to, uh, excuse me, this is a uh, public participant. It is not part, no, it is not public. Sorry. It is not public. Oh, I just see here so, with this okay. discussion. Okay. Uh, well, Councilman Barlow. Well, if not, then I'll move to uh, move for approval. Of, move for approval of this item, subject to all conditions. Thank you. To this include the um, the amendment, if need be. Thank that, you. That that is my motion. Thank you very much. There's a motion. Please vote. <clears throat> Please post. Are we stuck? There we go. Uh, motion carries. Thank you very much. And again, Ms. Norton, thank you also. We're moving on to item number eight, citizen participation. Public comment during this portion of the agenda must be limited to matters within the jurisdiction of the redevelopment agency. No subject may be acted upon by the redevelopment agency unless that subject is on the agenda and is scheduled for action. If you wish to be heard, please come to the podium, give your name for the record, the amount of discussion on any single subject, as well as the amount of time any single speakers allowed may be limited. Is there anyone wishing to speak under this portion of the agenda? Hearing none, we will move on to item number nine. Agency member recognition comments may be made by individual agency members during this portion of the agenda will not be acted upon by the agency unless that subject is on the agenda and scheduled for action. Is there any member of the redevelopment agency who wishes to speak under this portion of the agenda? Are there any other comments? Hearing none, this redevelopment agency is adjourned and we will move right into our ceremonial because I see so many guests here and then we will take a brief recess. No, uh, we we to, need, uh, unfortunately, we, need a, we can't do that. We need to take a so break. we are going to have a five minute recess so that we can change over whatever we're, oh, rolling out the podium. Right. 